Hello everyone! So welcome back to my channel In Search of Wonder. I just dropped my kids off at soccer and I have about half an hour or so before I need to go to my piano student's house. So I um, am going to get started with this week's wrap up. First of all, I was kind of a little bit, a little bit at sea and trying to figure out what all to read this week. I wrapped up several things last week and then I was like, hmm, now what do I read and what are the best ways to accomplish what's left of my Victober goals? So um, I knew I wanted to finish John Eyre that I had started in the Try a Chapter tag. And I kind of want to actually finish everything that I started or almost everything that I started in that video, but I don't know that I'll, t I'll have time to get to it all in October. Um, because I also wanted to read Silas Marner, which uh, was for a different prompt than any, any of those. And um, just one of the books on my TBR for my pile of possibilities for October that I really wanted to get to. So um, I settled on reading Silas Marner instead of any of those, in addition to John Eyre. And then um, after that, it's a little bit of a toss up, but I think I might read, I think I'm changing some things up a little bit. Um, and I'm going to read The Five, which is a nonfiction book. And it's technically a little bit breaking my rules. It's for the category of someone died for the Antober reading challenge. Um, but also I'm going to apply it to my own personal nonfiction reading challenge for the year. And that's why I say it's breaking the rules a little bit because it's not actually a book that I already had on my shelves. So, which is technically the nonfiction that I'm supposed to read is nonfiction on my shelf that I haven't read yet. So I'm breaking my own rules. I also broke another rule because uh, for the Read Your Shelf Challenge for Chantel Reads All Day, I'm supposed to read a book that starts with a G this month. And the only one I had on my shelf was Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. But I had so many other um, Victober and Antober reads that I wanted to do. That one just didn't really fit in that. And I do want to read it eventually, but not right now, not this month. So I read a book a couple weeks ago called Glass Town, which I talked about in another wrap up video. And you know what? I'm fitting that one in that challenge because it starts with G was not on my shelf, still not on my shelf. So kind of breaking the rules again there, but you know what? some rules were meant to be broken, right? Right? It's okay, right? Okay, anyways. Now that we've got the rule breaking done with, um, okay, so besides Silas Marner and John Eyre and The Five, like those are the main things I plan to get to this week for sure. And the Isabel and Alexander is another one that's for the category to make you cry. Um, so we'll see which of those I get to, but I do know for sure that I, I can check one of those off the list for the week. And that is John Eyre because I finished that last night and boy, do I have thoughts. Unpopular opinion warning. Now I say unpopular opinion. I'm pretty sure like 95% of the world's population would not agree with me, but it's there's you know a good chance that those of you who are watching this video are in the remaining five percent who might happen to agree with me on this so let's see here's the thing so you need a little background before I explain what my opinion is um, I love the creativity that she had and um, she really displays her strength as um, as a writer and in knowing her craft and that she was able to more or less pull off this book, which is a complete departure from everything else she's ever done. So first of all, it's a retelling. Um, so in a sense, it's, it, I mean, it's very original, but it's, she was inspired by two other classics. The one is Jane Eyre, which is obvious by the title of the story, 
that's the primary one that she's drawing from. But there is another one. If you dig hard enough online, you will find what the other one is. But it's two Victorian Gothic novels she's drawing inspiration from for her story, which makes it great for Victober and great for October because it's, you know, got all those spooky vibes, whatever. Um, she also does... Uh, a gender swap thing. So instead of Jane Eyre, we have John Eyre. Instead of Mr. Rochester, we have Mrs. Rochester, who, by the way, her maiden name was Blanche Ingram, um, which will ring bells if you have read Jane Eyre. Um, oh, Mr. Fairfax instead of Mrs. Fairfax. Mr. Poole instead of Mrs. Poole. So there's um, gender swapping of some of the characters. We have two stories combined. Instead of Mr. Rochester having a crazy wife in the attic, we have Mrs. Rochester, also known as Bertha, with a crazy husband in the attic. Although, let's take crazy husband to a whole new level here, okay? Um, I'll just say that much. So, it's more like a nasty, evil, crazy husband. Okay, we'll go with that. So, John Eyre comes as tutor to Bertha Rochester's two adopted sons. And, um, and then, of course, he and Mrs. Rochester fall in love. You know, follows the storyline of Jane Eyre uh, in many ways. I enjoyed... The creativity I enjoyed the gothic setting that's just really well done um it's very extremely a atmospheric if you're in the mood for a gothic read like this will check all those boxes perfectly um so there was a lot about it that I loved and as I was in the middle of reading it I was thinking oh yeah you know this is a good solid four stars for me um yeah even though it's very different from everything else Mimi Matthews writes and everything else that I normally read, I still would say that it's a solid four stars. But then the further I got, the lower that number dropped. And here's where the unpopular opinion comes in. Here we go, guys. Buckle up. This is my unpopular opinion. In this story, Bertha Rochester actually becomes the main character of the story and kind of steals the show, so to speak. Nothing wrong with that. But the whole point of her doing that is to hammer home the message that ultimately this is the primary message of the book. Women don't need men. Or to be more specific, maybe it wasn't not that, quite that broad. Let's not paint it with that broad of a brush. Maybe a little more specific. A woman in trouble does not need a man to save her. That's the message of the story. It's, it's, it kind of gets to the point in the narrative where it is spoken so strongly in this story that it's a little bit like beating a dead horse and it's like okay I get it you don't need a man to save you all right then fine go save yourself from the nasty evil deranged husband that you are barely managing to keep tucked away in your attic just go save yourself from him all right but the thing is she cannot and does not save herself from him. Now, John Eyre plays the part of a very dutiful suitor in the sense, I say dutiful in the sense that he never oversteps the boundaries that Bertha has put around herself. The primary boundary being, don't try to help me in my trouble. I'm going to fix my trouble all by myself. I'll kiss you and I'll force you to marry me and I'll do all of these things that Mr. Rochester does that irritates the living daylights out of people about Mr. Rochester, but I'll do them because I'm a woman and because I'm a woman, it's all good and it's okay. And also I'll save myself and I don't need you to save me. Okay. I'm really rambling because I'm like getting off on a tangent here. But anyways, in the end, she cannot save herself 
John Eyre doesn't, okay, I guess he kind of contributes because it would, but it would totally ruin the whole point of the story if he was actually the hero that slayed the dragon, right? It would ruin the point, at least the point that, that Mimi Matthews had in mind for this particular book. So he cannot single-handedly slay this dragon or he would be a man saving a helpless woman. And that would just fly in the face of modern thoughts on women. <clears throat> she is saved from her nasty, evil, deranged husband, but by an, a very unlikely person not the one that you would, I mean, you might suspect as the story goes on, but by and large, the unsuspecting character <clears throat> ends up rescuing her in combination with John Eyre, uh, who, you know, is helpful accidentally. Um, and so she is saved, but not by, not by any not by anything that she does. So here's my beef with the whole thing. Um, and, and it's primarily this, which comes 100% from my perspective as a believer. And my, my perspective that books and stories, the best books and stories will reflect even like, Christian or not, they don't have to be Christian books and this is not a Christian book. It's not trying to be a Christian book. But the best stories always illustrate in some way the gospel. And they're the best stories because, not because everybody agrees about what they're trying to say, but because it speaks to some, some need deeply seated within us that we need the gospel and the gospel is everything that is good and true and beautiful in life and so if if it is portrayed beautifully in a story then we will love that story even if we don't accept the gospel uh, um for itself this book is portraying an anti-gospel and that is my biggest issue with it because the whole message is Bertha saying, I don't need anyone. I can save myself. And that is just not a true story. And there is no goodness in that. There is no goodness and no glory in being arrogant and proud and saying, I don't need anybody. There's no goodness in that. All of us need somebody, even if we don't have a dragon to slay we need someone and in the in the book which this also kind of bothered me a little bit they use the very modern term ally she kept saying she just needed someone to be an ally not someone to save her just someone to be an ally like to fight with her um and she and they didn't put it this way in the book but basically what she's saying is i don't need a hero to step in and slay the dragon um she did say straight up, I don't need a savior. I mean, it was like right there in the story. And I just 195,000% disagree with that mentality. Um, the reason why folk tales and fairy tales and stories of old, the reasons why they had the hero come in and save save the damsel in distress by slaying the dragon was not because every woman is a weak woman who can't do anything for herself and not because every it, it wasn't about femininity or masculinity so much as it was about the gospel it is a portrayal of the fact that we as people men and women we get so like distracted by the the men and women thing blah, blah, blah whatever that's not important we as people do need a savior, 100%, each and every single one of us. And we need a hero to slay the dragon for us because we cannot slay the dragon ourselves. 
And that is what the hero who slays the dragon is about. It's not, it's not trying to say anything about the relative or comparative weakness or strength of men and women. It's not saying that women need men to save them. It's just saying that we need Jesus to save us. It's an illustration of that. So that's the main thing. But but the secondary thing, which I already kind of mentioned in my rambling soapbox venting, is that we all do need other people. Set aside gender for a second. We all need people to help us, whether we are men or women. Not, not a single one of us is capable of facing our lives alone. We're, we, weren't, we were never meant to do that. We're, it's not a good thing to want to do that. Anyone who tries to face a struggle or a battle on their own is like, I can do this. I can, I, I can, I can slay this dragon myself. I don't need anybody to do it for me. They may or may not be successful in slaying that particular dragon or defeating that particular foe that they have in their life. But I can promise you it would be a heck of a lot easier if they let other people join in on the fight. Whatever you're facing, pull people into that fight with you and don't try to fight it off on your own. And in the end, in this story, John Eyre, regardless of all of the things that she said, in the end, she did not save herself anyway. As much as she tried and wanted to be the one to fix it on her own and she didn't want to involve other people, in the end, inadvertently, she was actually assisted and rescued by other people besides herself. It, 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 it was not and would not be possible for her to overcome this magnitude of evil that she has um, that is, is fighting with her would not be possible. And it was not possible and ends up not being possible in the story for her to overcome it herself. She required the assistance of people who happens to be of the male persuasion, which is ironic, whatever. So ironic, I say only because if you read the author's note and if you're reading this, the, the narration, the whole point is a woman in trouble doesn't need a man to save her. But in the end, it was anyway. All right, so that is my unpopular opinion. I rounded up to three stars on Goodreads from two and a half. Um, and mostly, not because I disliked the writing. It was, you know, it was good writing. It was Mimi Matthews. I mean, she's a great writer. And I feel like the the story was well done. Some people complained that it was too close to the two gothic novels, like it was really a retelling of them. That doesn't bother me. I actually really like it when retelling sticks stick pretty close to canon um, and just add their own flair to it. So that doesn't bother me. It was, it was good. It was interesting. It was enthralling. Like I kept reading. Um, I wanted to finish it. Was it Sunday night? I wanted so bad to finish it. And I was at a really tense part in this story and I had to go to sleep. That was a really bad idea. It was like after 11 o'clock. I was like, okay, I have to work tomorrow. I'm so tired. I cannot stay up any later reading this story. I got to go to bed. So it kept me reading, but yeah. Those are my thoughts. And that was a very long, very long recap. So, um... I'll try to keep my other reviews that I of books I finish this week a little shorter. Um, but there you have it. Let me know your thoughts. Agree? Disagree? What do you think? And I will touch base later this week with more updates on my reading life.
It is Saturday morning and we are knee deep in cleaning and chores and hopefully getting to pulling out the summer clothes and putting in the autumn clothes. Haven't gotten to that yet because still working on the room cleaning part, but um, I am still working on Silas Marner. I have about 50 pages left in that, so hoping to finish that today. And I will do a clip with that later. But yesterday afternoon after work, there was a library book sale just down the street from where I work. So I stopped by, of course, naturally. And I got a few fantastic finds that I was very excited about. And as I was checking out, the I was just talking with the volunteer cashiers there. And the one... Uh, I happened to mention that I taught music at the school down the street and uh, first of all she knew someone who worked there and then she was like oh did you see any of our music books that we have for sale and I was like no I did not so she went back and showed me they didn't have a lot but of course I found a couple more treasures enough that it bumped me over the um, <clears throat> cash allotment that I had in my wallet, so I had to use my check card. <laughs> so, anyways, um, this is what I got. Um, we'll start with the music ones that are not perhaps so universally interesting. Um, this one is Musical Games, Finger Plays, and Rhythmic Activities for Early Childhood. So, Little red caboose, choo choo choo, little red caboose, choo choo choo, little red caboose behind the train. That one. Pop goes the weasel. Mm, cobbler, cobbler, mend my shoe. Get it done by half past two. That is a different one. I don't know that one. Tora lora lora lo. Stitch it up and stitch it down while I'm going round the town. Tora lora lora lo. Didn't know that variation. Anyways, that would be a fun resource. And then this I got for an easy sub lesson. It's three tuneful tales, the Bremen Town Musicians, the Pied Piper of Hamelin, and the Nightingale. And I always love to bring in literature into music class whenever I can. And um, this would be a good one. It has pictures so that, um, I can have that for an easy sub lesson. They can read a story and discuss or color a picture or draw a picture or do something related to the story or listen to some music related to it. So it's always nice to have those in the back pocket. And then this is a fun, um, I'm always also looking for singing books or like, like books that are based on songs so that you can sing it while you're reading it. And those create a fun element for, especially the younger grades. Um, this one is, how much is that doggy in the window? And I did not know there were like, I, this, this author may have made them up. But according to this, there are 13 verses to that song. I only had ever heard of the first one. So anyway, they all tell a whole story and then have these cute pictures. And then this one is about Bojangles, the tap dancer from the 30s, I think. Yeah, yes, well, I guess that's when he was famous. Yeah, during the, the Great Depression. And um, he performs shows on Broadway and in famous clubs around the country. Aha, that's why I recognize his name. He was, he danced in several films, including four with Shirley Temple. So um, anyway, this is just a, a cute little book about him, but, in a very childlike way. He didn't just dance, he made art with his feet. And then he danced past doors. Some were open, some were closed. Rap a tap tap, think of that. And I thought a really good extension activity to reading this book would be like stepping rhythms with your feet. And that even the older, like up into second and third grade would be fun. And then I loved the title of this song, of this song, <laughs> this book. If you can't manage them, you can't teach them. So true. And 
I was flipping through it and I was like, oh, there's some good suggestions here. And I like what they, I like, I liked the approach that I was seeing in here. Um, and there are some things in here that I think would be very useful to implement in one or two of my classes. So I'm looking forward to perusing that a little bit more and getting some good ideas. Then for the literature that I found. So, of course, I can't go to a book sale without coming away with something related to Jane Austen. Hang around here for a while and you'll find out I'm a little bit obsessed. So this is, has three of her unfinished novels. Lady Susan, or unfinished or like Susan. Okay, it says one of these novels is unpublished in her lifetime. I guess that's the Watsons. And the other are two unfinished fragments. Reveal Jane Austen's development as a great artist. So, any Austen I can get my hands on. I have read Sanditon, but I'm not 100% sure that I've read either Lady Susan or the Watsons. So, I can cross those off my list and have read the entire Jane Austen catalog. Then, um, kind of going along with that, I found this. It's called Charlotte, nice hardcover copy. And it is based on the Sanditon. So I can read Sanditon and then I can read Charlotte and see how they compare. This is Julia Barrett's completion of um, Sanditon. I don't know where it is right now, but I also have um, a copy of the Watsons that someone finished or reworked or whatever um, so I can do the same thing with those. Hmm. Fun times ahead for me. And then I got, this caught my eye because I've had Bronte's on the mind. This is Emily Bronte, A Life in 20 Poems. So it's Emily Bronte's poems, but each poem then goes on to, um, talk about her life a little bit. So Let's see. Whilst Emily Bronte wrote only one novel, the mysterious and universally acclaimed Withering Heights, she is widely acknowledged as the best poet of the Bronte sisters. Indeed, as one of the greatest female poets of all time. That's a big statement. Her poems offer insights to her relationships with her family, religion, nature, the world of work, and the shadow and visionary powers that increasingly dominated her life. Taking 20 of her most revealing poems, Nick Holland creates a unifying impression of Emily Bronte, revealing how this terribly shy young woman could create such wild and powerful writing, and why she turned her back on the outside world for one that existed only in her own mind. So, that seems very interesting. Um, she was such an intriguing person. And then, I this is one of my favorite books by, by Dickens but I only have a paperback copy. This is my current copy of Hard Times by Charles Dickens, one of my favorites by him. And I found this nice hardback copy, although I was realizing that, <laughs> I was looking at it, the, uh, it has a fragment of the jacket in it, which looks like it was a really nice jacket. This is the Everyman's Library edition. Um, really nice with the little ribbon and everything. So, um, yeah, I'm slowly, I'm trying to collect hard covers, nice editions of all of the books that the classics, particularly that I have read and really enjoy. So I can have a library with really good copies of them and not just, you know, paperbacks I picked up cheaply somewhere here, there, or the other. And then along that line, I have, I don't think I have a copy of this at all. Wait, yes, I think I do. So, uh, ha, interesting. Also a Penguin, popular classic. Um, that is the copy of Phantom of the Opera that I read, but I found this one, the Barnes and Noble Classics Edition. Nice hardcover with a jacket on the front. So, and I have not read that in a long time, probably due for a reread for that one. And then the other, the final book that I got is one I've not read yet, and um, it's one that really intrigues me, and I would like to read it. I don't know when I will get to it, because um, it's a little bit, as much as it intrigues me, it also intimidates me a little bit. Take off the price tag there. 
That is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. I have never read anything by him, but um, a lot of reader friends I know have read, really love Cormac McCarthy's writing. I need to, to read some of his works. And this one is the one that most intrigues me. Um, anyways, looking forward to reading that eventually. So that was my library book sale haul. And now I'm going to go check on the room cleaning progress. It is now Saturday afternoon and I finished the oldest boys clothes, got them all switched out and the summer clothes are now back in the attic. And I took a little break to eat some lunch and finish Silas Marner before I attack the younger boys clothes. So I finished Silas Marner. Yay. And it was, was very good. It, it grew on me as I read it. In the beginning, I didn't ever want to not continue reading it, it but it wasn't super compelling. It wasn't like a page turner. It's like, it's like, okay, I'm going to read a chapter or two before I go to bed or whatever. Um, but it wasn't like, oh, I gotta find out what's happening next or, you know, whatever. It wasn't super compelling. It moved pretty slowly, but then, um, it picked up the pace a little bit. And once all of the pieces, like it took a long time for, um, the author George Eliot to put all of the the pieces of the story in place and then um then once they started getting into place you could see where the story was going and what was happening it was a lot more interesting in the end a very heartwarming story with an unusual cast of characters the main protagonist the hero if you will of the story is is a middle-aged older man with um unfortunate past um, not necessarily brought on by himself, but kind of, you know, just how, how everything had fallen for him in the past. And anyway, so an unusual main character for a story, but very compelling nonetheless, and very sympathetic character. Um, from the beginning, you really are rooting for him and you want everything to turn out well for him. And in the end, it does. It's so it's a happy ending in that way. So that's good. And then there's a lot of interesting things going on in the story. Um, strong themes of family, and there's some multiple different types of family contrasted here in the story. And there's a um, strong theme of regrets and about how past choices and past circumstances affect the future. Um, there's themes of redemption and themes of um it's a lot a lot going on in this story <laughs> themes of like what really matters in life of love and companionship um so anyways there's a lot that is said in this book um definitely worth reading and now i want to watch the movie my boss saw me reading the book at lunch the other day and she said she really loved the movie I don't know what year it was, but Ben Kingsley was uh, one of the characters in the movie. So I want to look that up and see if I can watch that. Um, only thing I didn't like was I'm not sure that I really want to read any of, of George Eliot's other books, uh, Mill and the Floss or Middlemarch. I may have read Mill and the Floss at one point. I think I'm pretty sure I have read Silas Marner before. Um, I didn't remember much about it, but I'm pretty sure I had read it before. But um, I know I have not read Middlemarch, and it just intimidates me a little by its length. But I'm not sure. I don't know. I felt like her tone was a little bit um, maybe patronizing, condescending a little bit. Um, there was also a little bit of an element that you will frequently come across in Victorian novels of a little bit of um, moralistic kind of preachy kind of story, which is not my favorite, but even some of my favorite authors have that aspect to them. You know, you'll find that a little bit in Gaskell and Dickens. Uh, so anyway, but just, I don't know, there were some things about the tone of it, especially the first half, the second half, not as much, but definitely the first half. And I was like, I don't know. Um, wasn't 
I don't think that George Eliot would be my favorite author for that reason, but this story was overall well done. I gave it four and a half stars on Goodreads and I enjoyed reading it. And yeah, I definitely recommend it if you haven't read it yet. So that wraps up my week and um, I'm finishing Isabel and Alexander right now, a little more than halfway through, I guess. And we'll probably finish that over the weekend, but want to get this video up. So I'll include that on next week's wrap up. So once I finish Isabel and Alexander, then I have The Plowman's Talks by, or The Plowman's Talk by Charles Spurgeon that I will be reading next, as well as um, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. And um there's one more oh yes i have on my on my kindle from hoopla i have the five which is uh another nonfiction. so um i guess i probably will pick up another fiction when i'm finished with isabel and alexander um and the raven probably will do one of the ones that I had started in my try a chapter tag video, maybe East Lynn or A Hard Night's Work. One of those I will probably also start and um, work on reading those in the next week, week and a half. So coming to the end of October and my very and Victober plans are coming along nicely. I'm actually think I'm going to be able to knock everything off the list, um, all of the categories and the prompts, not all the books, like that was a big pile of possibilities. So I will not have read all the books, but I will have read something from every category that I had chosen and for all of my challenges. So anyway, um, that was my week and I want to get this video up. So there you go.